Hello, I'm Jorge Getoso. Welcome to a new program. On today's show, hundreds of social leaders and union activists are being killed in Colombia and the situation is deteriorating more and more. What are the challenges for the trade unions in Latin America and the US? Our guest, Kathy Feingo, director of the International Department of the AFL-CIO and deputy president of the International Trade Union Confederation that represents 200 million workers worldwide. Kathy Feingo, uh, one welcome to the program. Thank you. Kathy, you mentioned in a blog that you wrote and you titled Murder Trade Unionists, the Truth Behind Colombia's Trade Agreement. And you show some figures. And you said, for example, from January 16 through April 19, 681 social leaders and human rights defenders have been murdered. And you continue to see, and between 2016 and 2018, 70 trade unionists has been killed. And you say, in fact, the year of the TPA went into force until today, 172 trade unionists have been murdered, and you say, with President Ivan Duque, the situation for Colombian workers and trade unionists continue to deteriorate. How serious is the situation? It's extremely serious, and we saw just this week that you had you know, tens of thousands of workers and unions and their allies in the streets, you know, banging their famous pots, but what they were really demanding was of the Duque administration actual changes. The Duque administration has gone after workers, worker rights, trying to weaken labor law protections for workers. So the situation is quite serious in Colombia. Precisely, there is a huge strike that they have been made, uh, the workers against, precisely, against the situation. Yep, just a few days ago, they, they launched a general strike. So workers throughout the country took to the streets. They're really protesting again these policies of the Duque administration that are rolling back rights that they had actually won, the ongoing impunity. You know, Colombia is the most dangerous country in the world to be a trade unionist. And despite promises by the Colombian administration, the U.S. government, the situation is not improving. So how democratic is a society if the workers cannot organize themselves? That's exactly the problem. We say that unions are the muscle of democracy. And so when you don't let that muscle exercise exercise itself, you're really attacking democracy itself. And I would like to know the negative effects of the original NAFTA to both sides of the border, Mexico and the US, and also the negative uh, effects of the NAFTA 2.0. Exactly. We're in this moment where we're talking about NAFTA 2.0, but we should remember for the past 25 years plus, we've been living under the first NAFTA that was negotiated by President Bill Clinton here in the United States. He made a lot of promises to workers in all three countries, especially in Mexico, where he said wages were going to rise, the situation in Mexico get, would get better. But what we're seeing is actually that hasn't been the case. Wages in Mexico are actually as low as some of the, or if not lower, than some of the wages in China. So we really need to change the situation. We need a trade agreement that works for workers on all sides of the borders. We need to end protection contract system in Mexico, which means that workers cannot bargain and really increase their wages and improve their working conditions. Precisely, one of the big criticism is those trade agreements are being negotiated without the presence of the workers of the trade unions. Absolutely. So here in the United States, we do have a consultative mechanism that we are a part of. In Mexico, though, we're not even sure if the text has been translated into Spanish. Many of the unions and their allies don't even know what's being negotiated on their behalf. And so the lack of transparency in trade negotiations continues to be a huge problem. You have lived in the Dominican Republic. You have lived in Haiti. You have lived in uh, Nicaragua. What is the situation then and today in these countries? And if you if you will generalize in Latin America with workers and trade unions. Well, I think we've seen. You know, obviously, we've seen that labor market flexibility has been one of the policies that international financial institutions have promoted throughout Latin America, right? If to you make just, more money. Exactly. If you just weaken labor protections and sell a cheaper workforce to multinational corporations, somehow that will be good for the economy. But what we're seeing right now throughout Latin America is a backlash precisely on those types of policies. We're seeing that happen in Argentina with the recent elections. We're seeing it with the protests in Chile demanding a new constitution, a democratic 
democratic constitution. We're seeing that in Colombia, and we're seeing it throughout many other parts of Latin America. People are saying we need a change, and the current policies aren't working. In the case of Haiti, Dominican Republic, and Nicaragua, which situation worries you the most? Overall, I mean, in Haiti, there are enormous challenges of governance, and there's limited rule of law, and workers there continue to have very few protections and the lowest wages in the Western Hemisphere. Um, I'm concerned throughout Central America, to be honest, not just in Nicaragua, but in the entire um, Dominican Republic and CAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Area, because there is a promise of addressing insecurity, violence, and low wages, and that hasn't happened. The case of Lula in Brazil. Tell us about the relationship between your organization. We're talking about the largest confederation of uh, union in the U.S., that is the AFL-CIO, and your organization was going there. Absolutely. So we have a long history with the former president, Lula. He was a trade unionist. So he's one of us, as we like to say. And we were so happy to see, you know, when he was in power, he lifted millions of Brazilian workers out of poverty. Everyone talked about the Lula effect. He was then imprisoned uh, wrongfully, and the AFL-CIO joined with our allies in Brazil, Colombia, throughout the Americas region to demand justice and to demand an investigation into his case. And what we found and what the researchers found was that he actually was not guilty. He was recently released. Um, and just a few months ago, we were down uh, visiting him in jail to give him our annual Human Rights Award. And in the case of uh, President Bolsonaro, again, also trying to dismantle every possible workers' uh, securities and, and association. Absolutely. The first thing he did, to my point about unions and democracy, he went right after the unions. He's been trying to bankrupt the unions, trying to weaken labor protections. And so it's creating a real sense of urgency and some chaos in Brazil when you don't have those democratic institutions in place. We have seen recently the end of the General Motors strike. What are the lessons that you were following that uh, worries you the most, uh, or you believe that there were uh, successes or failures in, in the management of that situation? I think that there was a success. That was one of the largest strikes in the United States that we've seen in almost half a century. Um, 2018 was the year when we saw, have seen the most strikes in the United States for many, many years. What you're seeing in the General Motors strike is just one example of this, is collective action works. The workers stood up. They said, we don't want a two-tier wage system. We want our rights protected. And they stood strong. And they sacrificed. Um, they made very little during the strike. But they stood together. And they won a dignified contract. About 30 years ago, I would say that 30% of the workers in the U.S. were associated, affiliated to a, a, a union. Today, it's about 10%, so, so just one-third. What was the decision of the right-wing movements uh, in order to dismantle every possibility of association of workers? Well, our labor law is the first problem. And so the AFL-CIO has been very focused on introducing the PRO Act, which is our proposal for labor law reform in this country. We have a whole anti-union system. So the moment unions stand up and workers stand up to organize, um, you have a whole campaign by companies to undermine that campaign. Because of? Because they don't want workers to have power. You know, for years, when unions were stronger in this country, as productivity uh, went up, so did workers' wages, because they were able to bargain for those increased uh, resources. And today, you have a disconnect between productivity has gone up, but the people who are gaining from productivity increases are the 1%. Now, the future of work, uh, it's a fascinating area, and you were talking about that, and you say, there are massive transformations happening in the labor market, but those transformations should not mean that we continue to flexibilize labor markets and undermine working conditions. Those are the challenges? Absolutely. And we should say we need to talk not just about the future of work, but the future of workers and unions as well. And we believe that in our future, we need to have robust unions. We need to have strong protections for workers, regardless if you work for a platform company or if you're working in an industry where new technology is being introduced. Workers need to be at the table shaping that technology, helping implement that technology, and making sure that the technology is actually working to benefit not just the efficiency of the company, but benefit the working people. Because one of the issues that you bring, precisely in that subject, is uh, that uh, the future should not be whether or not a worker should be a self-employed 
or not the case of Uber, for example. Exactly. So we just saw a big case in California where uh, you know there's been big challenges about misclassification of workers in our country, and many platform companies like Uber and like Lyft want to say that these are not our workers. So they make huge profits off of the people driving for them, but say we don't want to accept them as our employees. And so this is a big challenge we face here in the United States, is making sure that more workers are actually classified as workers so they receive the proper protections under our labor laws. So how do you see the future in terms of the workers? In, because uh, more and more productivity increases, people don't need to go to offices, um, telework, uh, trying to avoid every possible social security. How do you see it? It's, it's a big challenge? Well, I see one thing is the fact that we have so much collective action happening right now in the United States sends a strong message. People want unions. People want collective action in their lives. Now, you, you point out the workplace is changing. So what unions need to do is change how they are reaching out to workers. We also see organizing happening online. So if people are working in their homes, they can now join together using some online platforms. And so there's new ways. And then you say uh, unions should be shaping the new economy. And my question, or the new economy is going to be shaping the unions? Well, I think if you want to have a, a new vision for our economy, which is one, we, we see we can't continue with this kind of inequality. So you have to have workers at the table saying, what should technology look like? We have an example in our hotel industry here where they just bargained a new contract with a major hotel company saying that anytime they introduce new technology, the workers will sit down with the company and test it and make sure the technology is not only benefiting the, the company for efficiency purposes, but benefiting the workers. Those are the types of policies we need to be looking for, workers coming together to shape. Talking about inequality, you, one of the areas that concerns you are the women leadership. And you said it's only about 5%. So it's a huge challenge in front of a woman in terms of working conditions. Absolutely. So we have a huge challenge both for women in the workplace who experience discrimination in pay, often in working conditions, but also in our own, in, in the boardrooms to union leadership, we need to see more uh, diverse leaders, whether it's women, people of color, immigrants, and people of other backgrounds. We need to have diversity in our leadership. The people who don't like the union say, sometimes they force me to belong or to pay for a union. What do you say? Well, this was a big uh, case here in the United States. We say that nobody forces you to be in a union. If you are represented by a union, though, it is important that uh, right to work laws, which are some of the laws that try to bankrupt unions, are not um, upheld. We believe that if you are uh, represented by a union benefiting from a union contract, you should support um, the benefits that you're getting from that contract. And you were concerned about the situation of migrants and you were visiting the, the border. The, absolutely, the AFL-CIO just had a delegation go to the border, go to El Paso, to be with the victims of the families from El Paso, to hear directly from them, and then to talk with them about what are the strategies we need transnationally to be working together as movements, making sure that we have just migration policies, migration policies that treat families, keep families together, and make sure families have access to a just immigration system. At least there is one analysis that says since the implementation of NAFTA, in the first 10 years, about 2.3 million agricultural workers from Mexico lost their jobs because of NAFTA. And because of those countries really govern from the rich and export the poor, many of the 2.3 million ended up in the U.S. trying to cross the border, working for nothing, with no rights, and they're blaming that they are the reasons of all the problems, and you see that from Trump campaign since day one. Mm -hmm. People who see this situation and say, this is, they are creating modern slavery, and this is perverse, because you are creating the slaves and then you are demonizing the slaves that you yourself are creating. Do you think that that analysis is out of reality? We need to create policies that give people dignity wherever they are living. So in Mexico, workers should have the right to stay and be able to work the land, have an agricultural job that lets them feed their family and, and provide for their family, and they should have the right 
to um, also leave if, that, if they're unable to stay in their country. That should be a choice as well. And we should have a fair and just immigration system. Our system is completely broken, which links workers to employers and often doesn't give them um, the right protections, uh, the protection to organize, to um, speak out when they're not being treated fairly. So we need to absolutely change the way our immigration system is structured here. Since uh, Donald Trump is at the White House, just a couple of hundreds of meters from here, how is the relationship between trade unions and the White House better, worse? Remember, the Trump came in saying he was going to fight for the forgotten worker, and I think he's absolutely forgotten that commitment. His focus has been to deregulate policies like overtime policies, health and safety policies. His tax policies have been regressive for working people. They've benefited corporations. So I would say that the promises that the White House made to working people have been broken. And it's more tension between trade unions and the government of President Trump? Well, absolutely. When you come in with an agenda to attack unions, you remember what happened with our federal workers. We had a shutdown where our 800,000 federal workers and all the contractors were out of work for a month. Um, the weakening of bargaining power for federal workers, all of that is direct attacks on unions and their members. Do you see a real difference between Republicans and Democrats at the helm of the country, meaning at the White House, regardless who is the president, regarding workers, or, or we're talking about the same, the same thing with just different shades? Absolutely. I think the current administration has an agenda, given the people he's appointed to the National Labor Relations Board, to the, the Labor Department, the Education Department. They have an anti-worker agenda. So absolutely, this administration has appointed people whose job it is to deregulate protections for workers. And I would say under a Democratic administration, we have many more um, representatives who share many of our values as a labor movement. But the most important thing is you have to hold your elected leaders accountable. And so if they tell you they're going to do something, no one gets a free pass. The labor movement will be watching. If they say, you know, we support you on a strong, robust uh, set of labor protections, we're going to hold them accountable, whichever party they're in. To which of all the situation in the U.S. regarding U.S. workers are you paying more attention? Well, I think we're paying attention, obviously, to the need for to reform our labor, our labor laws in this country. We need to rebuild worker bargaining power in order to really shift uh, the balance of power between employers and workers that has created so much inequality in this country. Kathy Bengal, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you.